It's time for a change. God offers His people a change that can only be described as spiritual awakening. Join Jackson First Baptist as we discover the path of spiritual awakening. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 13 with me. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Say amen if you're in verse 13. Hopefully we can hear those online as well. Here's what the Bible says. Look at it now. You are the salt of the earth. Say that with me. You are the salt of the earth. Now look at verse 14. Say it with me. You are the light of the world. Now look this way for a moment. You are salt and light. Say that with me. You are salt and light. I think you believe that. Jesus had gathered with his disciples. A spiritual awakening was coming. Now, awakening for those of you visiting with us, and you are welcome in the house and welcome online. Spiritual awakening is that moment in time when Almighty God blesses his church by infusing fresh anointing, fresh fire for the work of God in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been studying that. This is our 12th week together. We're halfway through the series, and we're halfway through, I believe, to the process of God's awakening. But Jesus, if you remember, had gathered his disciples. There were 12 of them in the crowd by now, and there were thousands around him. And Jesus, if you understand the original Greek, it actually says this, you alone. Now think about that. If we personalize that and say, you alone are the salt of the earth. You alone are the light of the world. This is what Jesus said. He literally is coming in and he's making it personal. Don't you just love when things get personal? Now I say, ah, I had some things this week I didn't like when it got personal. I like when worship gets personal. Jesus said, it's such an amazing, amazing verse. Look, as it comes on the screen for you, Jesus would say later in John 8 and 12, he spoke to a crowd saying, I'm the light of the what? Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, let me ask you, what do you have in your life today? This, this is important to hear. Charles Spurgeon said, said this, and so true, whoever puts their faith in Jesus Christ, their light comes to live. And he went on to say this, genuine faith in Christ turns a person from darkness to a marvelous light. It transforms them, and they have this light. The light is not them. It is the light that is in them. And it begins to come out the windows of your life. Jesus, as he launches into the body of his letter, has told for us, those of us who surrender to what God is calling us to do, we say that, that we are spiritually broken and only God can save us. We repent of our sin. We mourn from our sin. When we do that, we get thankful for what he's done. Then we step in, right? We become people, Sam. We become people who are impactful. Isn't that true? John MacArthur says, we become people of impact. We start showing mercy. We start becoming pure in our motivations. We are peace, not keepers, but we are peacemakers. And we endure some things along the journey. And so that's what Jesus was saying. And then he pulls these two metaphors to illustrate for us the fact that God has this work for you. Now, I wrote this down. Look as it comes on the screen for you. See if you agree with this or not. When Christ impacts your life, you want to be impactful for him in other people's lives. I just believe that. I just, I just see that here all the time, which, which leads me to just kind of engage with you. I remember we're personal now. We, we've kind of moved away from everybody else. So, so if you're saved today, you're to be salt and you're to be light. So let me track with you. How's your light doing? All right, if you have the light, are you so busy right now that it's, you don't have time to let it shine? Or, or maybe you're in some trials and tribulations and you just don't, don't know. Maybe you're just sick of things. And I, I talked with someone yesterday who's going through a separation in their marriage. And for them, that, that light is being hindered by the hardness and the hurt that's going on right now all over a America, the, the sins of our nation breaks our heart. And the light that used to be, that would beacon from us is not as much as it used to be. But here's some questions for you. One is this, in what ways are you impacting the world? In what ways are you impacting the world? Please send me your emails about this. And I want to tell you that you are in a church that's impacting people's lives. And so the second question I would ask in this, in, in, in what ways do you want to impact the world? What ways do you want to impact the world? I know this, when a person gets saved, the first people that they want to impact are the people in their family. Am I, am I telling the truth? 
And that happens with you and I. Then then it goes beyond our our immediate family. It goes to our extended family, maybe to a grandparent or a cousin. Somebody you might meet at an old-fashioned family reunion or get together at the beach. You 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 just have this desire inside of you because that you want to impact. And then if you're a student, you want to do that in your school. You want to do that on your job. You're just wanting to, to impact people's lives because that's what God is doing. Some of you today, I believe this with all my heart, God's putting something special in you that maybe you've been kind of fighting a little bit. You just don't know if that's what you're supposed to do. Can I tell you this? If God's lit a fire in you, let it burn. Just let it burn. You say, well, I need to start a business in a time like this. God's calling you to do it. Do it for His glory. Do it for His fame, whatever it is. You're not in retirement. You're not looking for the undertaker. You're looking for the upper taker. You're living your life. You want to follow Him. You want to reach out into society today. She said, Pastor, well, how do I do that? Well, look what Jesus says in the text in Matthew 5 and 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And then he gives this warning. If the salt loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Aren't you glad that's not you today? Verse 14, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand and they give light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Now watch this. And pat you on the back and be your best bud until the world comes to an end. It doesn't say that, that they may see your good works and, and give glory to God the Father. Now think about this fact. I ask you, in what ways are you, are you literally impacting the world? Jesus gives you two illustrations. Paul picks up on this. Write this reference down, Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Paul says this, do all things without grumbling and complaining. Do I have a witness in the room? Anybody in the room? Can anybody in the room say, I didn't grumble one time? How many liars we got? Raise your hand up in the room in the house today. Do all things without grumbling. There's moments that that we get in the flesh and we lose our saltiness, don't we? There's moments that we get in the flesh and we kind of lose our life. But he says, do all things without grumbling and disputing. Why, Why, Paul, why should we do that? Verse 15 said this, that you would be innocent and blameless. That you would be children of God. Here it is, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. Andy Walter, who's sitting upstairs, reminded me in a meeting on Wednesday night how I, I, I'd forgotten all about it. Years ago at a, our community group, he said he asked me af, after our group standing on our porch, uh, when w- was the time that the church would draw a line in the sand? Can I tell you, we're in that time. We're in a time of a crooked and a perverse generation. And I say to the governor of New Jersey, if I was there, my second grader would not be in your classroom. Because you're not going to teach my kid transgenderism as a way, as an accepted way of life. We will stand up in this day. We across America need to quit bowing down to what just a very small percentage of people are saying. You say, preacher, that's not that's just being angry. I'm not grumbling. I'm not, I'm just telling you I am an American who has the freedom to vote, and I'm going to vote, and you ought to vote and vote, vote, and get everybody to vote for what the Bible has to say. And we ought to clap for that. We ought to clap for that this morning. You say, Pastor, why, why do you say this? Because we're to shine as lights in the world. If I'm going to be a light in the world, I have to fuel the light by being with God. Spurgeon said this, the more you lean into Jesus through his word, the more you got to say. Now you say, what do you mean? you got a lot to say, I know it, but it's not worth much if it's not the word of God. I'm not up here giving my opinion or my viewpoint. It is God's word, and Jesus was going to lean into this sermon and Jesus is going to teach us how that we can listen. The title of the message today is when the spiritual light comes on. All of us have those epiphany moments when the light comes on. In the book, The, the Awakening, if you read the chapter with me, I entitled that chapter, When the Light Comes On. And I went back and researched and thought, you better be careful here. Do you know there's a secular song, there's a secular song called When the Light Comes On? And it is not a light that you and I would want to be a part of. Not only that, there's light that comes on people to do the wrong thing. The president of, of, of uh, Russia, it, it came into his mind, the light came on that the Ukrainians were wrong, and he's selling a bill of goods to his nation right now, saying that Nazism is taking place in Ukraine, and people think that he is their savior in that moment. A light came on, but it was a false light. 
So Jesus is here teaching us this point. And the truth is that when you have spiritual awakening, you start to get alert to things that you were never before. Not only are you alert to it, there, there comes this deal with you that you say, that's my assignment. You can tell now I'm excited a little bit. And the reason why is, is because I know with all my heart that what Paul said and what Jesus says is true. That if you'll just be salt, if you'll just be light to the world, you'll make a difference. So, so, so how does that work? Well, it begins with salvation. Paul, earlier in the book of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 12, he said this, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For the God who worked in you works for His will and His way. Can I say this to you today, that God is once again wanting His church not to be a light to the world, but to be a spiritual light to the world. And when it comes on, I want to tell you, we'll begin to see the marvelous change in this city. That's what my heart is praying for more than anything. Not just that the church would get alive, but that uh, this community would come to life in Jesus Christ. That, they, that, that our policemen will be able to police without worrying about murder at night. That our kids go to sleep at night and not worry about being abused or being hungry. That, that at nighttime, that parents again would come together, turn the TV off, and begin to invest in their own kids. You see, today, our teachers are the only ones that oftentimes invest in a child because the parents are nowhere to be found. But you see, when we become salt and light, it begins to be different in people's lives. So, so here's a third question for you. I'm just, I know, I know you're, you're drinking from a fire hose because I'm pulling it out from a fire hose. Or I know that. Number three question is, does God have a plan for you impacting the world? Look up this way. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. God has a plan. You say, preacher, is, is it really intense? Is it complicated in my simple mind or my complex mind? Can I do it? Oh, it, 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 it is so simple. It's called being salt and light. That's all you got to be. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, here's what God does. Number one, God does this as we read this together. God positions his people in the world. You say, Pastor, you talked about that last week. He really does. But here's specific. He says, you alone. See, where God positions me, he may not position you. And so when Jesus says to his people, he says, you alone, he's looking at those 12 in the midst of those thousands. They were probably thinking this, how can I do this? You imagine particularly a little later on when Jesus has been with a group of people for three days and they had nothing to eat, and he looks around and he says, you give them something to eat. You know what? They said, Lord, a whole year's worth of salary could not feed these people. And Jesus said, well, what do you have? And they had just a few loaves and a few fish. Am I right, Sam? And Jesus said, give them to me. And so I want to say this, wherever God's positioned you today, you need to give yourself to Him and you need to give what that position is in your life because it's about to be something amazing. He says to those people, you are the salt of the earth. How many of you like salt in the room? Be honest. My grandmother was such a blessed person, she'd look at some salty before she ever tasted it. Our daughter-in-law was here this week and I made popcorn on Sunday night and I said, hey, you, you can put the kind on yourself. And she salted it so much, I'm telling you what, you couldn't taste it. You'd had a heart attack tasting it. Now, some of us, we look at salt that way. It's called the universal condiment. But in Scripture, there are two things that it was often representing. One was this, it was a preservative. You know what a preservative is, don't you? It's something that keeps it going, keeps it alive. In that day, there were no ice makers. There was certainly no refrigeration. And the only way that they could keep something in place was, was to put salt on it so that it, that it would not decompose and rot away. Did you get that? It would not decompose and rot away. Do you know that Jesus says that when he saves you, that he puts inside of you a saltiness so that, that the world would not decompose? Every time that a mom and a dad raises their kids and loves them and disciplines them in a loving way and cares for them, that is an that is a answer to the abortionists that it is wrong. Every time that you vote and you vote what the Bible says, you, you are being salt to the earth. Every time you draw, Andy, that line in the sand and say, no more, and no, whatever I have to go through and whatever I have to do, you have put your line in the sand. Each time that you live the way you're supposed to and stand up the way that you're supposed to, salt in the wounds hurts. I get that. But boy, it sure helps. It gets out the corruption that is in there. And I am praying and, and I am stomping everywhere I can with preachers and people. Though everybody will get, let me even speak to them and give to them our research, resources. We're just giving everything away and saying, will you rise up to the smallest, to the largest, that we again will become a preservative. Some of you have laid down and you said, well, I'm just going to try to get by with me. Don't do it. Go out into the public arena everywhere. 
Every time a kid in a a college says, I'm not going to drink with you tonight. Why not? Because I know Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go to a party where they're changing partners and having premarital sex. That's because that you're standing up. You are a preservative. And the devil's greatest desire is to keep you from being salt to the world. But it's not only preservative, it's also a flavoring. You see, you, you are not only preservative, but you are a flavor. And you are the spice of life. You're the people that, that, that others want to be around. Woodrow Wilson was running for the presidency in America. He was in a barber shop, and it was all kind of discouraging. And this guy came into the barber shop and sat down, and it kind of just lit up the room. He didn't know who he was. He lit up the room. He was kind to people. He was loving on people. Left the guy more tip than Woodrow Wilson did. He left, and Woodrow Wilson said, who is that? He said, that's a preacher of the gospel, Dwight L. Moody. Friend, today, our, our problem is, is this. We have failed to realize what we have at our disposal. When you leave that 20% tip, you are a spice to a mama that's having to work two jobs. When that you pay your right fare and don't take advantage of people, you are making a difference in the world. When you go up to the umpire after the game and say, thank you for going through this with us, you, you are the spice of life. And the America has enough of sadness. But if you don't have the joy of the Lord, if you don't have the joy of the Lord, I, I can tell you in my own life, I just sometimes come in here and have a fit by myself. Because sometimes y'all just kind of, oh, why he screams like that? Friend, I've been saved. I've been redeemed. I am heaven bound. And I can tell you this, I can meet the devil and with the power of God turn them in from a sinner to a saint. You can either be half empty with your glass or half full. But if you don't have Jesus in your life, you can't be salt. But he said you're not only salt, you, you also are light. You see, salt speaks about your character. Light speaks about your voice. If you've got character, it opens your voice. If you don't have character, it closes your voice. Now look again what Jesus says. Jesus says, you're the lie of the world. Verse 14, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, when we think about this for a moment, we understand what John Stott, the great, great theologian, said. He says, the light is not ours. It is Jesus Christ who is the light, who comes inside of us. But I know this, the more of Jesus that you put inside of you, the more out your windows comes the light to everybody around you. Now, this is important for us to, to get for a moment because sometimes we fail to let Jesus come in, and then we also fail this sometimes in our lives. Now, watch this. We fail to move forward. Now, you say, what do you mean? Now, look on the screen. God always does first a work in a person before He does a work through a person. Is God doing a work in you? If He does a work in you, then then it's obvious He'll do a work through you. Because some of you are like this, I need to do something. Preacher, every week tells me I need to do something. I just don't know what to do. Listen to me. If God's doing a work inside of you, I have never had to generate when I'm walking with God what I need to do. Brother Larry, isn't that true? You don't have to. He, he's going to put it right there in front of you. He'll put it right there. But if you're not with him, if, if you're, if, if, listen to me, if you're just being beat down and worn down, you're not going to know how to parent. You're not going to have a grandparent. You're not, you're not going to know how, how to single person, a married person. You're not going to be able to know how to do any of these things. It's because your light is not being fed. And I want to tell you this, that God wants you to do this, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, the things that you've received from men give to faithful other people. Hand it off. Hand it off in every part of life. Be handed. I say, my kids are not safe. Hand off what you're learning. You see, some of us listen. You say, preacher, I don't feel like doing it. You know why? Because you 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 need to come out of this. You 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 need the anointing, the fresh anointing. You see, that's the light of the world that comes inside of you. But but would you write this down as well? God only positions you, but He also protects you. Some of you are afraid. I'd never, I'd never thought of this before, Brother Danny, when it says here, you are the light of the world, and it says a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Why would people hide? I grew up in a Bible-believing, fundamental King James only, independent Baptist church, where they always emphasize the negative over the positive. And there is negative here in the text what we, when, we, when we don't do what we're supposed to be, but how about this? Some people have to go into hiding because they're being persecuted. Do you know that in places in America, there are people being persecuted today? 
I'm thankful that I'm a pastor of a church that loves the Lord and loves the Word of God. I never worry about preaching from this pulpit the Word of God and somebody pushing back that's in the membership. I get emails along and get letters every once in a while, but they're never from the members of this church. But do you know I have pastor friends that this Sunday morning, if they'd preach what I've preached already, particularly the New Jersey part, they, they'd be castigated by the end of the service. Persecution. God's protection is for the now and for the moment. It is not the length of your witness that counts. It is the impact. So would you be willing to suffer for two years if you have the one opportunity to win a thousand? Would you be willing to be the salt and light of the earth? And listen to me, in the midst of a world today that's going to increasingly get vicious, if we, if we continue in the path that we're in within five to ten years, I believe that what I preach now, I'll have to go to jail for. And by the way, I hope that I'll be able to preach to you from jail because I'm sure not going to change if I'm alive what I believe because the book is not changing. But God protects you. I want to tell you this, you are bulletproof until God's finished with you. This is not the problem with most of us. Most of us will do what Jesus said would happen in here. You people in verse 15 do not light a lamp and put it under a basket. Now, what in the world would that be? They light it and they then take something to cover it. You know why? Because they're persecuted. They don't want anybody to know it. But for some of us today, we've come to that place that we've so turned away from the Lord that we, we put the basket. You know who the basket is? It is the false teachers of our world. The false teachers that told us to say nothing when Roe versus Wade was being voted on. The people that said to us, there is a separation of church and state, so we can't rise up and say the Ten Commandments still need to be in school. Look this way. I challenge anybody in this room or online to show me ever in the Word of God where there's a separation between church and state. There is not. That is an American concept, and that's part of the problem we're in now. Church, you do your thing, and we'll do our thing. And if you are crazy enough to believe that they want freedom of religion for everybody, you're wrong. They want for everybody but one group. And that is for those of us who stand in the light of Jesus. False teachers have rose up in our day to, and said that the Word of God is no longer inerrant. That we need to redefine the Word of God. The, the, listen to me. Preachers have rose up and put, the, put over, over the, the gospel, prosperity gospel. They've rose up and put the, the false gospel narrative that, that, it, that it's okay to, to be gay as long as you're married. They've now taken the, said it's okay for transgenderism and all these different views. And we've sat, we've sat in the pew when we should have voted them out. When we should have rose up and said, listen to me, I want to say this to everybody online. If you're in a church where the preacher's compromising the word of God, get out. You say, wait a minute, we'll vote him out. Well, listen, you've been there all those years. They didn't vote him out. It's time to get out and get in a place where they're going to storm the gates of hell with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and preach the truth of the gospel. And some of you say, preacher, I don't like that. You need to get over it. Because if we don't fight for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as salt and light, this country is done for. You say, oh, preacher, there's no precedent for it. Have you ever heard of Rome? Have you ever heard of the great nations of the world? They all, listen, they all fall from within. It's never an outside source. It's always from within that they fall. When they turn away from God, then God turns away from them. You say, preacher, that, that's hard preaching. No, 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 no. It's not hard preaching. It, 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 it's wonderful preaching to say that God liberates us. Jesus gives six illustrations in Matthew 5. He gives six illustrations of how the religious leaders of his day, they put a basket over it. I want to just read one for you and see if you've ever heard such a thing that, that Jesus says here in chapter 5, verse 27. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said. Now, when he says this six times, he's saying the Pharisees taught this, but the Bible actually says this. I say this. He says this, you shall not commit what? In that day, they said this, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, when you, when you are light to the world, your eyes, watch this, are the window to your soul. They were saying, as long as you don't do the act, here's the deal, friend. When churches begin to preach about the act and not about the heart, we've inverted the process. And listen to me today. That's why we desperately need spiritual awakening because if a man's heart is not right, listen to me, you can't change him. I mean, our three-year-old grandson had to understand something this week, that if he didn't do what was right in the midst of love, he'd get lit up. 
Not the electric chair, not, not abuse. I only had to light him up one time. And I lit him up good one time. And he stood there in shock. And then he started to cry. And I looked at him and I said, do you know why you're crying? And he looked at me and he said, because you hit me. No, sir. I did what Jesus said to do. Listen to me. Mamas, don't give up. Just don't don't give up. Listen to me. When Jesus taught, Jesus never ever dealt with the exterior. He dealt with the heart. Why would the governor of New Jersey push such an agenda for 10% of the people? His heart's wrong. Why would presidents do what they do against God? Their hearts are wrong. And friend, today when we vote our wallet and in, in our, in our, in our happiness instead of the truth of God's word, it's an indicator of our heart. Now notice what Jesus says here. If your right eye calls you to sin, now what does it say? <laughs> Y'all don't want to talk about you. Oh, this, this, uh, tear it out. One translation says cut it out. Like, wow. How many of you would be eyeless today? Now watch this, and throw it away. For it is better for you to use one of your members than your whole body, or lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Jesus was not literally saying cut, off, cut your eyes out and cut your hand, but he, he's teaching us metaphorically this fact, that when we sin, that the window to our heart is our eye, And that translates into our hand. And he says you need radical spiritual surgery. And friend, today, how are they going to know that unless you and I are salt and light to them? That's why back in the text, and we're we're about finished now, listen to me, Jesus. No, people don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all, first of all, in the house. You see, friend, I cannot today draw a line in the sand for your house until I've drawn it at my house. That's where it begins at my house. And Tony, you've done that at your house a long time ago, and you still got that line. You and Donna do. Thank you for that. And so by many in this room. But now watch what it says in verse 16. In the same way, if you check your faith at the door when you leave here, something's wrong with your heart. I love them. People like Wayne Dooley, I'm with him out in the community. And, and a grown man, 40 years of age, looks at him and calls him coach. And when Wayne looked out like that at him, and he, he said, who are you, boy? He said, when I was nine years old, you coached me in football. And you taught me how to be a man. You see, that's, it starts in your home. And then you begin to to go out and and you let your light shine before others that they may now watch. See. Why do you want them to see? What do you want them to see? I'm, I'm done now. I think I've offended everybody, at least one. Don't intend to. I love you. But you see, to, to be a light, you've got to get the darkness out. Salt had impurities in that day. And all it was good for, Brother Jerry, was this. When, they, when the, the impurities began to work in the salt, well, all they do, they take the salt and put it out on a roadbed and people drive across it. I don't want to be a Christian that people drive across and say, there's nothing impactful there. I don't want to be a church. I don't want to be a dad or a grandfather. That when people come by me and say, ah, he talks a good talk. We Didn't we not read 1 Corinthians 13, our reading plan this morning? If, 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 I'm a, if I have a gift of prophecy, if I gave my life to be a martyr, but if I have not love, I'm nothing. You see, today, friend, I just want to tell you that I want to give you great encouragement today that God is wanting you to be salt and light. They'll see your good works, and watch this, they'll glorify your Father. So what should we go home with this thing for? One is this, listen to me. God also makes you productive in the world. That's how we're going home today. This, this last thing, God makes his people productive in the world. So I just leave this with you. I just leave with you as you go home. I just really try to obey the Spirit with you. Listen to me. You are salt. Say it out loud. I am salt. One more time. I am salt. I am light in the Lord. Say it one more time. I am light in the Lord. That's who you are. 
That's who you are. So today, just be a man or a woman of God. Repent if you need to about some things. If there's things you need to change, just do it. Just repent about things. And then embrace the positions you have. God's given you some positions to live your life in. Just live them for Him, for the glory of the Lord. And you know what you're going to do? You're just going to live in such a way that, that, listen to me, forever you'll be thankful for the day that you said yes to Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking the time to find God's answers to life's greatest issues. We hope that you would reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions and check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.